I'm Tim Ellis, and I have been attending LifeBridge Church for about two years now. I was born and raised Catholic. Um, I was, you know, an altar boy for years growing up. Um, I went through confirmation and then pretty much was in a Catholic household growing up. The big change for me came when I was 18 years old and my uncle had passed away and he was someone I was very, very close with. I mean, he was more like a friend, even like a second father. To this day, it still works me up when I think about his death, but we don't know if he had an asthma attack that caused a heart attack. Wherever it was, we, you know, he was found on the floor with his inhaler. After all of that, it changed me uh, from a religious standpoint. Like, I was very upset with God. I didn't agree with his plan, as I've come to realize that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all his plan, but at the time, I struggled with it deeply. I mean, I, I was, I became pretty much an atheist. It took me to a dark place, and I, I pretty much was there for a long time. Then, in 2009, was when I met my wife, and she was the first step, I would say, towards my path back to God. She grew up in a very religious household as well, but still was in a religious household. And obviously, we are together. We have three beautiful boys. Um, but that was like, that was the first step when I became a police officer, actually. I, you know, I started working in the community. I seen things that, you know, most people may not see, whether, you know, it was horrific car accidents, um, you know, children that were killed, um, things like that, that just really made you still, you know, question God's plan. What first brought us to LifeBridge was when my wife found you guys on Facebook, I believe it was, and it was for an Easter egg hunt. We stayed for the service. And we went here and I was like, this place is awesome. I was like, this is where we need to keep going. So we started coming here week after week and, and then eventually, like I said, we, we got the boys into the program here. And they absolutely love coming to church now. And then them, you know, cultivating a relationship with God is what really makes me happy. Because I know that as long as they have that, they'll never, they'll never have that fear that I had had or that resentment I had or any of the problems that I had had because they'll know it's all part of God's plan. You know, like, what's the worst guy that can happen to me? Because even if I die, I know where I'm going. Where I'm at now, if you would have asked me three years ago, I would have never believed I'd be here. You know, I, I'm i in a much better place spiritually and I just, instead of wondering what I can do for me, the idea of what can I do for others or what can I do for God, it's just, is more present and it's, it's a very overwhelmingly good feeling and it makes me feel better on a daily basis. Yeah, give it up for Tim. So, so don't come up and tell me you've experienced some life change because I'll ask you to be on camera, okay? Um, that is just such a commonplace story around here, and I want to show you how that works because it doesn't work like this. It doesn't work like, hey, I just get up on a Sunday morning and, and I do my thing and the band does their thing and we do a few things over there. That all happens when we come together, when we unite, when every single person in this body, every, every person that attends LifeBridge makes a movement in their life, when they, they decide to become part of something greater than themselves. I want to explain to you the greater than concept. This is actually something we believe God laid on our hearts a, a few years ago, and it comes from Philippians chapter 2. I want you to watch this movement, this shift that, that Paul describes in Philippians chapter 2. And as I describe this, as I read this, I want to say again, this is what God wants for you. If you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus yet, I want you to know if you do, this is what he wants for you. And if you have made that decision, this is what he wants from you. And if you don't make this shift, if you don't make this adjustment, if you don't make this change, you will come to a dead standstill in your faith. And it won't have anything to do with your church, and it won't have anything to do uh, with the relationships in your life. It'll have the fact that you kind of stopped at a point. So let me, let me describe this. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 1 says this. Therefore, Paul says to the Philippian church, if you have encouragement from being united with Christ, anybody got any encouragement from being united with Christ? I, I mean, have you had that moment where you're just like, you were overwhelmed with shame or there was guilt or there was, there was like, you didn't know what to do and your life was just kind of aloof and then all of a sudden you found Jesus. Maybe it was, maybe it was when you were young, maybe it was when you were old, maybe you made a bunch of mistakes, but somewhere along the lines, kind of the sky opened up and it was clear what God really felt about you, and you understood that God loved you, He cared for you, He wanted to forgive your sins, He wanted to blot out those sins, and He wanted to write down your name in the Lamb's book of life. And you remember that encouragement that you felt from that? That's all Paul's saying. Man, if you've had any encouragement 
from belonging to Christ, if any comfort from His love. You ever been in that place where there was no good answer? There was only grief, there was only frustration, there was only despair, but somehow in the middle of that, in the eye of this storm, right in the middle of it, there was God's comforting love. Have you experienced that? The Philippian church, I think in the back they would have been like, yep, we experienced that, I know you've experienced it. You have benefited from God's love. If any common sharing in the Spirit, right? Have you ever ever just experienced the Spirit of God? And you're like, man... He's real. You know, when you try to show it to somebody else or you try to tell it to your parents or your friends or your kids or something, they're like, you're weird, right? But you know what you experienced. And you're like, man, that's that's the Spirit of God. If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy be complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, one being one in spirit and one of mine. Now listen to what he's saying. He's saying, if you've benefited from God's love, If you've benefited from God dying on a cross, forgiving your sins, comforting you, placing His Spirit inside of you, if you've benefited from that, then it's time for you to share that. Right? If you've benefited from what God has done in your life, it's time for you to help others benefit from Him. That shift in your life is absolutely essential. Maybe another way to put this is when we start attending church, you start attending church as a consumer, and it's okay that you do this. I, did, I would do this. If I was out there looking for a church, I would be a consumer, right? You go to your grocery store you go to and the restaurant you go to, why? Because you like those, and you don't like the other ones, right? And so when you find a church, you do the same thing. So you, many of you probably walked into this church like a consumer, and you walked in, you went, okay, all right, bowling alley, that's nice, yeah. Leonard Skinner's plan, I don't know what that's about. (laughs) Children's ministry, awesome, right? Worship, man, the music is powerful. Engaging preacher, handsome pastor. You're, as a consumer, you've got all your needs met, right? Now, now don't get me wrong, I don't blame you. That's exactly how I would find a church too. I would be like, is this going to be beneficial to me? As a consumer, is this going to help me? Is this going to help my family? Is this going to help me grow closer to God? Is this going to be beneficial? And now that you've picked this place, or now that you've arrived at that, God wants to make this shift in your life, where now, instead of consumer, you become a contributor. And instead of just saying, yeah, this is good for me, that you might say, but, but how can I contribute to help others? This is a big shift. Right? Here's how we get it done. He describes it in the next verse. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, catch this, value others above yourselves. Nobody does that. Think about this. In your world, your parents, your family, your friends, the people you work with, they value you, right? You've got friends. You, you even do this. You value other people. But isn't there an underlying sense that they're in the relationship for what they can get out of it? Not all the time, but there's an underlying sense with a lot of people. I, I have a lot of really great people in my life, and I'm in a relationship with them, and I can just sense that they're only in it for what, and the moment they're not getting anything out of it anymore, they're just splitsville, right? They're not really in it. For me, they're in it for, for them. So even, even some of our healthiest relationships are bound by we're just in it for what we can get out of it. And Paul says, here's what you ought to do because you've been, you've been changed. You're new. You're different. You've been transformed by God. Here's what you ought to do. You ought to value others above yourself. You're not in relationships for what you can get out of it. You're in the relationship for those people. I'm telling you, that's profound. That's difficult. That's tough. It's crazy even. But that's what Christ has called us to do because that's what Christ did when he died on the cross for you. He valued you above himself. Here's how we say this. This is the translation we pick out, and and it goes like this. Next one. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others greater than yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. 
Really simply, if I could give you a picture of what your faith needs to look like, not as, not as a beginner, not as somebody new to the faith, but as somebody that's going to grow in the faith and become a disciple of Jesus and do big things that God has called him to do, this is what the picture of your life should look like. This next picture here. You just value other people above yourself. And every person you meet, you go, you are greater than me. And that person that wants the same job that you want uh -huh, is greater than you. And that person that you're, you're sitting next to today and your neighbor who keeps, who keeps doing things that drive you nuts, you go, you're, you're greater than me. One of the people in our church, Steve Wilk, he has a tattoo of the greater than symbol. That's how you know you're making an impression when people get a tattoo based on your sermon. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'd like it if you guys did this. He has a tattoo. It's got a greater than symbol. So every time he shakes somebody's hand, you're greater than me. I'll tell you what, there's not, there's not much more humbling in the world. Uh, we used to take communion at the old building, and I would stand in the back, and, and the guy that would bring me over the communion, his name is Mark, and he'd walk over, and he'd hand me the communion, and he'd say, you are greater than me. And I'd be, and I'd be like, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> and, and then I would say, no, you're greater than me where we get a little argument back and forth right over communion, over the, it's a beautiful picture, over the blood and body of Christ. We're arguing over which one of us is, the, you're greater, no, you're greater, no, you're greater. And that's, that's something the world isn't familiar with. And that is what you and I have called, been called to do and to be. That's us. Now, as we make this shift, again, I'm asking everyone, if you're out there looking and saying, yeah, this, this church is doing great things, you're doing great things, I'm, I'm saying, no, we. Like every single one of us is going to come together, and we're going to come together to do something to consider the people in this community, in our world, downriver, southeast Michigan, to consider them greater than ourselves. How do we do that? Well, I want to share with you today a little bit of our vision. And as I share with you this vision, I want you to know there are so many different ways to plug in, but it's not our vision. We honestly believe we're just following Christ's lead. We're just trying to do what is obvious. Like, this isn't profound stuff, okay? Like, churches are always working on vision statements. We're like, well, our vision is to specifically, and I'm like, Jesus laid it all out for you. It's not complicated. We're not, we're not coming up with brilliant stuff ourselves. We're just kind of running after what we is already in the New Testament, what Jesus wants us to do. I want to share with you specifically where we want to go, and then I want to ask every single one of you to jump in, to lay down your life, to sacrifice what you are for the people in our community and in our world. Specifically today, as I share our two-year vision, this is what in the next two years looks like at LifeBridge. You can, you can see what this next two years looks like. As we do this, specifically today, I want to attach not just the volunteers, not just the talents that are needed, but also the dollar signs that are involved in that. So as we move forward, we're going to be talking about what God wants us to do. And I'll be honest with you, it's going to take every person coming together as it always has to make this happen. Now, before I get to this, what I want to share with you is just that I, I know this works. I know this works. You guys probably don't know this, that there's a magazine called uh, Outreach Marketing. And uh, outreach marketing, I don't expect you to know what this is unless you're a pastor, but outreach marketing, they started compiling these two lists um, several years ago. The first list is the biggest churches in America. Nobody cares about that. The second list that they write about is the fastest growing churches in America. Now, people are really interested in the fastest growing churches in America because, like, I'm talking about these churches that are, are big mega churches and churches, like when I was at a church of 50 people, I'm like, what am I doing wrong, right? I would like try to, try to figure out what was going on. So I would look at this list of the 100 fastest growing churches in the nation. This last spring, they called us and they asked us to report our numbers for this. And we're like, okay. So we just turned in our spreadsheet of what we normally, normally have, you know, and we gave them to them. And then they called us a couple months ago and they said, hey, we just want to let you know you are one of the hundred fastest growing churches in America. And yeah, let's celebrate them. And so they are flying me and John out to Colorado to meet with all the other churches of the hundred fastest growing churches in America to try to figure out what we're doing right. 
I'm going to be like, I'll tell you all what we're doing right. <laughs> Woo! Um, you got to build a bowling alley <laughs> in your church is what you need. Um, no, but I mean, that, those are the things they're going to be interested. They're going to be interested in the bowling alley. They're going to be interested in the children's program. They're going to be interested in all that. But I want them to know, and they already asked me an interview about this. I was just like, but I'll tell you what it is. It's this concept that we consider others greater than ourselves. We consider others greater. And so I want you to know, I know this works. As we come together and we lay down our lives as a united front and we sacrifice and we give our time, our talents, and our treasures to God, He produces life. So let me share you with our two-year vision. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle this off pretty quick. And, and as I do that, you might have a lot of questions, and I just want you to know I want to answer all those questions. So please come up to, to anything, that, anything that you consider a church leader afterwards. Hopefully they are a church leader. But anyway, come up to us. Come up to us afterwards. We'd like to tell you. Here's our, here's our three-phase vision just for the short-term future. This is pretty, pretty simple stuff to begin with. The first one is just uh, this. It's stability. We want to we wanna get to a stable place. Now, this one's kind of boring, um, and I, here's what I think. I think in every household, there is probably somebody that's a little bit more fun and like, let's go on the vacation, and let's buy the car, and let's, let's get a new house. And then there's that other person going, no, let's do the responsible thing. So if you're that person, if you're the responsible person in your household, go ahead and raise your hand. Right? Oh, we don't have very many responsible people. Okay. <laughs> no, no, you guys are going to love this, okay? We are now... Uh, building owners, which do you remember that first time you owned a home? For those of you who are homeowners, you're like, this is great. And then the garage door breaks and you're like, crap, I got to fix that, right? That's mine. Can't just call the landlord anymore. So we're kind of in that position where we've gone over this whole building, but we are paying off things from, from getting in the building still. We're, we're, we're not too far away, but we're still making that kind of payment. And on top of that, We've got like a back part of this that, that leaks, the roof leaks, and we're going to have to do it, and it's not going to be cheap. It's going to be a $70,000 add-on. Out in the parking lot, there's parking lot things that are coming in the future, and so we have to do the responsible thing. We have to prepare for these things that are coming up. And here's why we call that stability, because we don't want one cent of that to come out of our children's ministry. We don't want one cent of that to come out of outreach. We don't want one penny of that to come out of what we're doing here at the church that's actually working. And so our first plan is to, to pay off what we have and look towards the future with stability. And so what we're looking to increase over the next year is 165000 increase to our yearly budget just so we can fix stuff when it breaks and we can be prepared for the future. And, and hopefully, you know, if things get rough, we can pay the staff when we don't have any money. So anyway, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the responsible thing. It's not a lot of glitter on it, but here's where we get a little more fun. The next thing, and that's one, and this is two, the next thing that we're looking at is it's time for us to build up a staff to support the ministries that are already here and we already need. Build up a staff. I want you to know, I've talked to so many different churches, and I tell them kind of our story, and they're like, wow, that's just, that's just great. You must have an incredible staff. And I'm like, we do have an incredible staff. And then I tell them, we have, we have some part-time, we have some volunteer, and really there's only two full-time staff. Two full-time staff for a church like ours, and they just their, their mouth hangs open. They're like, there's no way. There's no way. I know churches with 200 people that have 10 staff members, right? So my point with that is we're a little understaffed. We're, we're greatly, compared to other churches, understaffed. And we have just gotten to this point, and it is obvious it is time to, to build up. There's, there's certain things that we're just not able to do anymore uh, until we have somebody working on that full time. Of those, here's the top three. This isn't everything, but this is the top three. Discipleship. What I mean by that is somebody comes to the church and they're like, okay, came to church, now what, right? And I'm like, read your Bible, do what it says. You know why we say that? Because it's cheap. That's, that's why we say that. No, no, that is very important. Don't stop reading your Bible and doing what it says. But we honestly, we need somebody that's like, oh, well, here's, here's education. Here, I think that Christians ought to be the smartest people in our community. 
I think they ought to be the most educated, not only on what the Bible says, but just about everything. And they should grow in their faith. They should worship God with their mind and grow with that. I think people ought to be in community. Some of you out there, you've been coming to church for a while, but you're not connected with any other Christians. And that would be the role of a discipleship pastor. We have people that are getting out of the baptistry, like, man, I made a decision to follow Jesus. And it's like, but, but now, now what do I do? And we want somebody full-time focused on, on connecting, educating, and developing people in this church because we don't want to be a church that's a mile wide but only an inch deep. So that's huge. That's probably our biggest unseen need as a church. The second thing we want to go into is our youth ministry. Uh, we have done uh, youth ministry with volunteer leaders. Kenny Beasley has been doing our, our volunteer stuff, and he's just, been, he's just been like, I'm doing what I can, but you guys need a full-time youth pastor. And, and he was like, you, you need this, and your youth minister needs this thing called a budget. You know, he needs to be able to do things with it. And I'll tell you, this is one of our biggest needs, both in the church, in the church. We, we have so many opportunities uh, in the church, but also out of the church. We put a basketball hoop up. Just a couple of weeks ago, we left one out accidentally. We walk out one day in the backyard, and guess what's happening? There's 15 high schoolers out there playing basketball. They literally walk across our lawn. We have some that have come to service, or may even be here right now, who just show up and hang out during church. There's nothing else to do. West side of Telegraph in Taylor, Michigan, right? Okay? So they're just hanging out at the church. And it is, it is time that we give our middle school and our high school a lot of focus and attention. And you remember being in middle school and high school? You remember? Those are pivotal moments. Some of the worst mistakes you've ever made happened in middle school, high school, and since then. We want to grab them before they make the mistakes and at least say, hey, Jesus, then go make your mistakes. And, when, and then when they're 30, they'll be like, Jesus. <laughs> That's at the low end of the spectrum of what we, what we want to happen. On the high end of the spectrum of what we want to see happen, man, that, that they might realize that God is the Lord of their life and they surrender their life to Jesus Christ before they go in and screw up everything, right? That's, the, that's on the high end of what we want to do. So we want to give a lot of attention to that. I'm running through these, but I'm finally online. You guys don't know this, but we, have, we probably have about 40,000 views online each month. 40,000 people are online. For every one person that attends LifeBridge, we have 10 people out there that are viewing us online. So if you ever wonder why I, I do videos and I put on a wig and, and, and do weird stuff like that, it's because we have people watching us. Now listen, we believe this is one of the most innovative and excited places that we can go. And just real quick, I could go into this, but people decide today, this is the world we live in, people decide what they believe about really big concepts, about God, about faith, about mor morality, about same-sex marriage, about abortion, about politics. They decide what they're going to believe in their worldview, not based on what they see on news, not based on what they were raised in in their home, not, raised, not what happens in church. They base every view of their life on a three-minute video that they watch on Facebook. That's what people make their decision about what they're going to believe. And we want to interject into that. We believe that's... That's the, that's the bleeding edge of where the real gospel is being spread in a big way. So we, we need a video production team. We want, to, we want somebody that can get in the YouTube and the Facebook and, and Instagram and really reach out into our community in all kinds of different ways. Lots to say on that. That's where we want to go. We want to build up on like this really solid, healthy staff. Now, the third one, and I don't even have hardly time to, to go into it, but the third one that I think is the most exciting is we want to become a church that plants churches. And we want those churches that we plant to plant churches. So church planning is where we want to head in the future. Church planning is where we want to head in the future. And here's why this is a big deal. Because multiplication beats addition every time. Let me, let me, you remember when you were in, uh, in uh, grade school and the teacher was like, okay class, would you rather have one penny a day doubled for 30 days? Or would you rather have $10,000 a day for the next 30 days? And what did we say? Well, we want $10,000 for 30 days, right? And then there was that one goofy kid whose mom had already explained the math to him. He's like, I'll take the one cent double for you. You know what I mean? You remember this? 
And so we that chose the $10,000 a day ended up with $300,000 at the end of the month, right? This is back when I used to pay attention in school. And uh, 300000 and and Aaron over there, he ended up with $10 bazillion, right? Because multiplication beats addition every single time. Listen, we grow, and, and let me tell you, that's the kind of math that Jesus Christ built his kingdom on. The reason it still exists today is because he understands that multiplication beats addition. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Like, over the next 10 years, we could grow and we could continue to be on the top 100 growing churches and all that kind of stuff. And maybe in our, you know, wow, we'd have like 5,000 people. There's still 300,000 people in our community that don't go to church, that don't have a relationship with Christ. 300,000. And we took care of what? 5,000 of them? Right? But if we plant, let's say, five churches that plant five churches over the next 10 years, and they have even minimal success, we're at least looking at double, but we're probably looking in the thousands and thousands of people that are being influenced, not just by our little church, but being influenced by different pastors from different walks and different backgrounds and all kinds of different people. This is the hardest one to grasp, but this... This is where we die as a church. You know, I, I drive by buildings all the time, and you see these big churches that were built like 30 years ago or 100 years ago. And you're like, what, what happened? Why did they stop growing? Why, do they, why are they just these big churches? And I'll tell you why, because I felt that when we moved in here, I went, wow, man, we made it. Church for four years, 100 fastest growing churches. We have a bowling alley. We got the children's ministry, nice good sized church. Why don't we all just sit back and think about our 401ks, right? Let's just th- sit back and relax. And I know that's what happens in churches, and that's, that's not what Christ has called us to do. He wants us to come together as a church, and He wants us to lay it down. And He wants us to divide and conquer and multiply. And so we want to be in a position to be ready to do whatever God wants us to do. And I'll tell you, it's surprising to me, I probably have two or three meetings a week with interested church planters, people that want to start churches, people that are like, yeah, LifeBridge is great. We want to do that. And so what we want to do is we want to put ourselves in a position where when, when it's time, we're ready to say, then go, go and plant. And so over the next two years, we would like to increase our annual budget by $200,000 for church planning so that we can be able to staff, so that we can be able to fund, so that we can be able to give away a little piece of what we've got here and plant it in another community. Now, just hit the big picture here. Where we're headed over the next two years is we're looking to increase our annual budget by this much. Go to the next slide. $565,000. We want to increase our annual budget. Now listen, you might be like, that's a big deal. Well, first of all, our church has grown by 44%, and we're looking at increasing our budget by 42%. I know, it's crazy that we would increase by the same budget we've grown. But the, also the thing is, as you look at that big number, you might be like, wow, that's, that's kind of crazy. Here's what's beautiful. When we come together, we have that greater than concept, and we do what God has called each of us to do at our own level, This is where big stuff happens. Let me show you how cool this is. On the next slide, you'll see this. So if if 150 people in here were to give $10 a week, I love this. I love this. I love to see this this math in in a group. $10 a week. What's $10 a week? For some of you, that's a significant sacrifice. For some of you, that's a Starbucks drink. For some of you, that's that's a big deal, and, and maybe you've never made a contribution before, and you're like, I could start with 10 bucks a week. If made that, that's $78,000 a year, right? And you might even lose weight if you quit drinking the Starbucks drink, right? <laughs> not that we support that. We're not about losing weight here. Anyway, um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so just put this in perspective. And I, again, I'm not asking where your neighbor's at or where that person's at or where I'm at. or where I, I'm asking where you're at. Maybe if 75 people said, well, I, I've never given before, or I can increase my giving by $25 a week, you might go, oh, that's, that's just going out to eat. That's just going to one less movie. That's just whatever. If people do that, if just 75 people did that, that's $97,000 a year. You see how that multiplication math works? When we come together, we are able to do big things. Some of you might be looking at that $25, $100 a week. 
And maybe, maybe for some of you in there, you'd be like, man, that's my entire salary right there. And for some of you, you're going, yeah, I could do that, and it wouldn't even hurt that much. And then and I want you to know that's, that's where God's calling. That's how you consider others greater than yourself. That's how you go from being a consumer to being a contributor. So here's what we want to do today. There is, there is no pledge card that we're going to have you fill out, right? We're not going to put you on the hook. We don't have security guards that are going to uh, stop you at the door and ask you to write down an amount at all, right? We want you to just pray about this. We want you to think about this. And next week when we come, these boards right here are going to have those increments on there. And all we're going to ask you to do is to consider what you could increase your giving. Maybe it's nothing and you're going to increase it to something. Maybe you're giving a certain amount, but you're going to increase it from there. We're going to ask you to come and take these cards and put they're going to be magnets. You're going to put them on your fridge and you're making a contribution for one year. So all you're doing is letting us know what's your commitment for the next year so that we can do what we feel like God has called us to do. And here's what we're going to be asking you to do. We're going to ask you to live out 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, right? Anybody growing in their faith? In speech, the way you talk, right? Hopefully we're growing in the way we talk to the people we know. In knowledge, your understanding of what God wants for your life, an understanding of the Bible. In complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, right? Just as you're growing in every way spiritually, listen, this is so important. He says, see that you also excel in the grace of of giving. We want you to consider what God has given you because that's, that's on loan to you, right? God has given you that for a purpose. We want you to consider, man, what has God given me and what could I do with it? What does God want me to do? Again, we're not asking you for anything today. We want you to just pray. Pray with your spouse. Pray with the people you know and say, what could I do in order to do what God is, is trying to accomplish in us. Um, we're going to close out, and before I, I do, I just want to say, man, the, uh, the first week we had all these baptisms over here. Uh, it was the first week we were in the building. I think we had 22 baptisms, and people were coming out of the baptistry, and, and they were smiling, and there were, you know, if you've ever been here for a baptism service, you know what I'm talking about. It was just like, man. And I was looking at those lives, and I was looking at what was happening, and I was like, that is because, because of a group of people coming together and considering them greater than themselves. That's what it comes down to. It wasn't because I preached a great sermon. In fact, I remember that day. It wasn't very good. Well, I, I have bad days, and that was one of them. Anyway, it was because of a group of people that had laid down their life and had sacrificed and given, and, and we had come together, and people out in the audience that they didn't even know had laid down their life so that they could have a relationship with Christ. And maybe you're one of those people. And Christ is calling us not to just consume, not to just benefit, but to show that love and to contribute. Let me pray. Father God, I pray, I pray for where you're leading us in the future. I pray for the lives in here, God, as we lay down our lives, just as you laid down your life for us, God, that we would be able to give life to the people in our community that the people that are out there who don't know you, that maybe never even picture themselves in church, God, that we would be able to reach them and lead them closer to you. God, I pray through our offerings, through our sacrifice, that you would do big things. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.